We're going to do this in three, two, and one. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio TV. It's brought to you by the Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1, my new book featuring over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest music legends the world will ever know. And it's available now on bookbaby.com and amazon.com. John Hall has written songs for Janis Joplin, Bonnie Raitt, Ricky Skaggs, James Taylor, so many more. He's played guitar in tours and records, recorded for Little Fee, Taj Mahal, Jackson Brown, and Seals and Cross. His music and environmental activism led him to 10 years in elective office and co-funding Muse, Musicians United for Safe Energy. Now, back to music full-time, he writes songs and performs solo, and with Orleans, the group he co-founded in the 1970s. Of course, their biggest hits, Still the One, and Dance With Me, continue to garner hundreds of thousands of streams per week, and to appear in mass media from commercials to movies and even political campaigns. Uh, the former is also in the title of John's memoir, Still the One, A Rock and Roll Journey to Congress and Back, Reclaiming My Time, is John Hall's sixth solo record, in addition to the 18 albums he recorded with his band Orleans. The title is a phrase used in Congress, where Hall spent four years after being interrupted. It's also an allusion to the music he might have written and played during 10 years in elective office. Reclaiming My Time is available to purchase now at Amazon.com. Please welcome American musician, songwriter, politician, environmentalist, and also the founder, longtime member and founder of Classic Rock Legends, Orleans, John Hall, to interviewing the legends. Hello, John. <laughs> Hi, Ray. Thank you so much. Thanks for that big buildup. People don't realize how hard it was to get on Zoom uh, this afternoon, so hopefully they never will. <laughs> well, you know, I just wish I'd bought stock in Zoom before uh, February of 2020. But, uh, you know, we use the technology as well as we can. Exactly. And technology is moving so quickly, it's hard to keep up. So we're doing the best we can, like you said. How's your racquetball game? And now are you are you back to racquetball now that the uh, pandemic is slowing down or? I haven't played racquetball in a while. I, really? I, I switched to tennis from racquetball, which is maybe a problem for well, me. <laughs> for me, it was because racquetball is a very wristy stroke and, and tennis, at least the way I'm capable of playing it is I can't have too much wrist or the ball will go to unpredictable places. But um but, you know, I've just been, I've been doing various things for sport, exercise, uh, entertainment. And right now, the athletic endeavor that I'm involved in is getting back to playing on stage with Orleans and, and, and doing my own solo stuff as well. We just, the last two weekends, we played for the first, the first shows we've done in a year and a half. And, How'd that feel? Great. It felt great. I mean, my calluses were a little sore, you know. Yeah, sure. Your tips. Um, and uh it was more a problem of you know, remembering all the harmony parts and remembering all the words to some of the songs. I, you know, I've written enough songs that some of these things I just if I don't sing them all the time, I come up with the words out of sequence. And uh, uh but it's all okay. The audience has has been very happy the last two shows i don't think they noticed any of the mistakes that we noticed in our own performance no they're just happy to have you back you know that you know it, it, if, if there's lots of mistakes who cares you know we're hearing music again that's the main thing right and seeing yeah. people playing it for us and, and yep. for us having people that we can look at and sing to mm -hmm. and play for uh, directly as opposed to you know online we've done a lot of work in the last year and a half uh uh, online recording remotely. Do we made uh, well a lot of this record, most of this record, uh, reclaiming my time. Uh, my new record mm -hmm. was done in isolation and uh, songs written in isolation to a great extent. Um, but to be in the same room, it's like it's always better to be in the same studio together than right. to be recording from different cities in different states. Uh, 
online and trying to sync it together and make it sound like you're in the same room. And it's the same thing with being on stage. There's, there's no substitute for, for playing as a societal, as a communal event where mm -hmm. the audience sees it and hears it as it's being made. And, um, and so I, we're, we're very happy to be able to do that. You know, I wish you kept uh, in the public eye as far as politics, because then I could say I interviewed the president, you know. <laughs> you kept, you should have kept on going, man. <laughs> I, if I'd have kept on going, I would probably be dead. I'm sorry. To say. <laughs> I, no, really, I I had a couple of serious health problems. Really? And my, and my, I won, you know, two terms in Congress and yeah. ran for election in 2010 and didn't win that one. And it turned out that I had uh, I had prostate cancer and I also had an aneurysm. Wow, I didn't know that. I was sending aorta. Well, nobody really knew, but now I'm telling you, you get the scoop here on I your show. I get the scoop. Yeah. yeah. No, it was really a case where if I did, probably if I'd been reelected, mm -hmm. I would have been on the floor on C-SPAN saying, "If we don't stop this climate change, <laughs> you know," and then I would be a one-day story in Politico or something. But. How do you recover from an aneurysm? I know, I know that's that's some heavy stuff. Well, the first thing was to have surgery to correct it, and right. then after that, it's just take it easy for a couple months, and right, you know, you gradually you you start out with a weight restriction on what you can lift, mm -hmm. as with a lot of surgeries, any abdominal surgery or chest cavity surgery, you you know, you have to you have to heal enough that you can lift any weight and and not spike your blood pressure or your uh, pressure inside your cavity where your lungs are and other organs, heart, especially. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so it's time and then it's working your way back. And I, I did rehab. I, you know, it's, it's like any other injury, basically, um, in the sense that if you follow directions, don't try to rush it, but do your exercises. So you, you, you know, you can get back to, to normal. And i very blessed and happy to say that I that I uh, can pretty much do anything that I was doing before, uh, maybe even more so. That, that's awesome. I I just had some. I had Tommy Rowe on recently, and he just told me he had quadruple heart surgery, and he feels better than ever. But he he didn't tell anybody, and I was the first to know on that one as well. I guess right. Well, about my cancer surgery, I didn't tell anybody because I was in the middle of the twenty trend camp. 2010 campaign. Okay. And uh, I told my chief of staff and my right. older brother, and I think that was it. Uh, I just uh, didn't think it was A, anybody's business, and B, mm -hmm. I didn't want people to think, oh, I won't bother voting for him because he can't, he won't finish his term, right. or I can't contribute, I won't contribute money to his campaign because exactly. he won't be able to do it. Um, so I, uh, you know, I kept it to myself and was only after that election night, uh, November 2010, that I mm -hmm. that I did tell my daughter, and <laughs> yeah, a few other tough. people who really should know. That's hard. But at that point, I already I was already cancer free. So good for you, uh, a lucky guy. I ha I had a uh, biopsy done on my prostate too because I had a scare. Uh, it turned out it wasn't cancer, but you know it's 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 a scary thing. You know when you have to go through all that. I was. You know, thinking the worst, of course. You know, it's a scary thing that that uh, the number of people who get cancer is uh, percentage in the United States has been rising higher. When in the seventies, it was one out of every four Americans yeah. statistically would have some kind of cancer, right. and then it was up to one, one out of every three. And I think it's now more like half of all Americans will have some kind of cancer in their lifetime, and that number is going to keep going up. Yeah, as long as we keep pumping out plastics and yeah. And, you know, different, you know, hydrocarbons and sure. pesticides and, you know, PF, PFOAs and all these different chemicals into the atmosphere. It's and hard. I'm, you know, I've, I've done a lot of, uh, as you read in the mm -hmm. intro, a lot of environmental work and that's partly why I got into politics and mm -hmm. uh, but also writing songs about it. And there's a song called Save the Monarch on this mm -hmm. record that's about the, the different endangered species that we are pushing to the point yeah. of extinction. If we don't wise up pretty soon, and right, that was written as a hymn. It was uh, my little brother was a priest, and my my mom had a master's in divinity, and I heard oh, wow. a lot of stuff as I was growing up about you know moral you know living, and mm -hmm. uh, 
and in particular, you know, being good stewards of the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, but in the song, I, I sang a duet with Dar Williams on this uh, on this song, Save the Monarch. And mm -hmm. uh, it saved, I wrote it so it would sound like God Save the King or God Save the Queen, but it saved the monarch butterfly, yep. save the king, the king condor. Mm -hmm. Watch them rise. Save the queen, the queen of the honeybees. The honeybees, right? Uh, and you know, all of these different species are are in trouble largely because there's a so many people on the planet. Period. Maybe mm -hmm. too many people on the planet, and b because we just can't seem to think of them as as, as important as human lives are. Um, and so, and the bridge goes. The lyric to the bridge: uh, It has been written. You gave us dominion over things that walk the earth, mm -hmm. swim the sea, and soar the sky. Forgive your people who know not what they do. Mm -hmm. Lift the veil from our eyes. So it's a, there are actually biblical quotes, beautiful in, lyrics, yeah, uh, scriptural quotes, yeah, in the song. But it's you know it's a pretty song. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. melody, and and you know I always like to try to uh, write about whatever's important to me, sure. whether it's the one or dance with me, or yeah. time passes on. Yep or Save the Monarch, or Power, mm -hmm. uh, these different songs, if it's important enough that, if I feel it myself as being very important, then mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to communicate it by song. Well, I love the album. I gave it five stars. It's called Thank Reclaiming you. My Time. Uh, it is out now. I think the official date was May 28th. Right. And uh, I want to talk about the album. Um, one of my favorite, late, the, the uh, it starts out with Think of You, which has got Sharon Vaughn. Who, Sharon Vaughn's very, very famous. She's worked with so many people, Dolly Parton, Waylon Jennings, Kenny Rogers. Right. Um, she's, she's worked with the, uh, the Jordanaires, um, you, you know. Right. She's written a ton of, yeah. of hit songs in the country market and also mm -hmm. has you know, been writing for the pop market as well and for writing with uh, Swedish artists and producers. Right, right. And so on. So uh, yeah, Sharon's great and really fun to write with and quick. I mean, she's such a good lyricist. So I, you know, I think of you as a melody that I mm -hmm. I came up with, and you know, she wrote the lyric to it, and and it's the only song on the record that doesn't have harmony backup vocals on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why. That's just the way I heard it. So mm -hmm. so that's the opener, and uh, and hopefully we'll make people happy enough that they listen to the second track. You know what I caught on that song, John? The guitar sounds a little bit like the Beatles and the Birds. Am I right? Right on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. It, I caught that. It's I, that I chimey, think that's cool. Yeah. That chimey thing, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I always liked, well, one of the things I loved about the Beatles was their intros and endings. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they they wrote, for instance, the intro on eight days a week. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the first time I heard... Uh, the first time I heard uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, the intro on that, the guitar intro was so recognizable. Um, and, you know, the same goes for everything from All You Need Is Love to, mm -hmm. to uh, Strawberry Fields. It goes, it goes on. But uh, Lady Madonna, mm -hmm. this, you can identify the song by the intro. Exactly. And so so yeah. I think of you, I, I set out to try to do that. And it's yeah. that 12-string ringy mm -hmm. kind of sound. Like bells of Remney, or uh, turn, turn, turn. The, the birds. Yep. Versions of those songs. Yeah, I heard it in the song. It's great. I love it. Um, you alone too long. Um, Co-written with a couple of guys, John Paul Daniel, Tad Richards. Great saxophone in that. In that. That's also. There's also an official video out for that. From, Correct. I guess on YouTube. You can find that if you go to johnhallmusic.com. Yep. Or to my my webpage, John Hall Musician on, I'm sorry, my Facebook page. And it's, uh, John Paul Daniel is a, a friend of mine for 35 mm -hmm. years. Uh, he and his wife were longtime friends of mine. Mm -hmm. She passed away about um, 20 months ago. Oh. And uh, I was on my way driving down from the Hudson Valley of New York right. to Nashville to say goodbye to her when she passed. And, uh, but I was there with John Paul for the visitation and the funeral. And, Mm -hmm. And the day after the funeral, we started writing and we wrote the song really? history for the third song. Huh. This track. But anyway, so after after John Paul had, you know, eight months of grieving or so after, you know, he was lonely. 
and yeah. and uh, in grief. But but he asked another friend when it was okay to start dating, mm -hmm. and the guy said, "Don't stay alone too long. You might start to like it." And I thought that's a song. That's got to be a song. <laughs> and uh, and it was too home, too close to home for Tad right. for uh, for John Paul to finish with you, but Tad Richards. Right. Fabulous lyricist and mm -hmm. sculptor and artist and poet from Woodstock, mm -hmm. New York, uh, wrote the lyrics uh, with me for that. Incredible song. Thank you. Lessons, well, lessons you co-wrote with Janelle. I had Janelle on the show, Janelle Mosser. Great, yeah. Yeah, and, and you were on her um, little black dress, I guess. You, you guys worked Yeah, together. that was a live performance of her and me at the Bearsville Theater in Woodstock. Yeah. Um, and those are all songs on that record that Johanna and I wrote with Jonelle. Mm -hmm. uh, so this Lessons is written with Jonelle and Johanna. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of my, uh, actually, you know what? That's another song with no harmony. I, I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, but, um, but it's, I'm proud of my guitar playing on that record. Uh, on yeah. that song. Um, I've heard people make comments about this kind of thing like you know i needed to learn patience mm -hmm. i wound up in a traffic jam mm -hmm. and uh and the song just jonelle came up with a lot of those ideas and mm -hmm. you know johanna and i uh filled them in uh but uh yeah jonelle's really fun to write with she's a great singer she's cool. a great songwriter and actually yeah. i'm doing a show july 8th in nashville with her mm -hmm. and with uh um it's jonelle mosser and friends with, mm -hmm. with me being one of those friends and John Cowan, who sang on this record and played bass on World on Fire and with Andre Zahn, who sang on three tracks on this record, um, mm -hmm. will be Jonelle's guest for that show, too. So it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, she's really cool. She goes on and on about you and, and your wife. You know? Oh, well, that's yeah. nice. That's, she's, yeah. she's a really close uh, friend as well as a fabulous songwriting partner. My wife's from Kentucky also, so we kind of hit it off. <laughs> yeah. Um, one song, this was really cool. It's, um, Isla Morada. Is that, is that how you say it? That's Isla Morada. Isla, Isla Morada, which is in the Florida Keys, right? It's, it is. Yeah. yeah. One of the middle keys. It's, uh, uh, it's a beautiful place. And, but the song is kind of a, I, there's a lot of South American and Caribbean influence in that. I mm -hmm. to visit uh, um, my daughter when she was on a Fulbright in Brazil for a year. I, right. you know, for, and I sailed my boat, uh, cool. uh, one of my one of my sailing trips to Cuba from Key West, and um, on a humanitarian aid mission that was mm -hmm. legal. We got a letter from the Treasury Department saying we had permission to go. Awesome. And um, but uh, so that song has a bunch of. Uh, you know, it's kind of sort of a samba uh, beat or mm -hmm. a, um, it has a couple different Latin uh, South American influences in it. Uh, it's just also a song of uh, lost love, you know, it's a, uh, and Johanna and I, my, my, my first wife and mm -hmm. songwriting partner on all these songs, a lot of these songs, mm -hmm. um, Honeymoon in Isla Mirada. And, um, so the song is kind of refers to that. I, uh, um, you know, it's, it's uh, like I said, I, I write about things I feel strongly about, sure. you know, whether they're, you know, falling in love or breaking up mm -hmm. uh, or trying to save the, the planet, is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, I'm kind of embarrassed. I've lived here in Florida for 18 years. I've, I've never heard of uh, that place. Uh, yeah, I've never heard of it. I know Key West and that, and I've never been to Key West. Well, yeah. it's a beautiful place. Yeah. I um, spent some time there mm -hmm. a couple times. And um, so, yeah, the Isle of is in the middle of the Keys. It's, okay. uh, it's not as far down the Keys as Key West or Marathon. Right. Uh, but it's it's below Key Largo. Yep. yep. And there are a lot of really tiny keys in between that people don't yeah. talk about as much. But uh, but Amarada is a beautiful place. And I had some friends who, uh, uh, Billy Davidson and, and Paul Case, play mm -hmm. uh, there at a place called the Lorelei. Uh, right. Every uh, 
every winter they they start a uh i guess you could call it a uh an invitational a uh a residency at the mm-hmm. Lorelei in Isla Mirada uh, in around October and go right through the winter into spring. Oh, and then nice. Back to north. Yeah. Very nice. Um, another sunset, another beautiful tune. Kind of, uh, I heard a little eagle sounding in there, kind of a beachy type flavor. On that yeah, song. and more Brazilian as yeah, well. Yeah, Brazilian as well. Yeah. Yeah, Steve Warner and I wrote that song together. We, really? We've written a couple of songs. Steve uh-huh. and I wrote a song called You Can Dream of Me, which he recorded. Mm-hmm had a number one country hit with and and uh, a song called language of love which is on the orleans um grown up children album as well as um, he recorded it on one of his records and and uh so and a couple songs that have never been recorded this one um was originally cut as a demo and uh then i you know added a rhythm section to it that does the sort of brazilian uh, uh bass and drum part to it and percussion uh and steve sang a duet with me on that it's uh he's such an extraordinary singer and player he was playing chet atkins gut string guitar that when chet died hmm. his widow gave that guitar to steve really who had played with chet a lot and uh. you know backed him up on the road a bunch and was sort of a protege of chet's so um yeah that's a very very special song to me and and it's it really is about being uh being on some island or some vacation spot with somebody you love and not wanting to go back to reality, not wanting to go back to work or, you know, to the mainland mm-hmm. and uh, from whatever island you're on, <laughs> which could have been Isla Mirada. But yeah, Another Sunset is, uh, it's, it's a song that's out of, a little bit out of my normal bailiwick. Right. But, but, you know, I like all different kinds of music, so I try to write <clears throat> And arrange them as well. Sure. Another beautiful song. Uh, of course, you mentioned Save the Monarch with Dara Williams, which is a, a another great song. Uh, Dara Williams is another, you know, person out there that's been around for a while. Uh, you know, played with Sean Coven, Joan Baez. I mean, the list goes on. Mary Chapin, uh, all the folk festivals. Another great song. Um, all up and down. Uh, another one with Joe, John Paul Daniel, a boogie. Yeah, woogie. John Paul and I wrote that. It was boogie was, woogie country. <laughs> I was celebrating a celebrating yeah. a birthday, and somebody came up to me and said, "Congratulations, happy birthday!" Well, it's all up and down from here, <laughs> and you know it's true. Like you want, just when you think that things are getting better, you're on the upswing, and you got it knocked. There will be some kind of a always some kind of a downswing, always. or if you're depressed and everything seems like it's gone to hell in a handbag. upswing. <laughs> then you know it's not going to stay that way either exactly so living in the middle is the key to having a stable yeah life and and uh for me to you know not let my emotions go too far one way exactly. or the other I so agree. yeah it's all up and down from here it's just situational you know <laughs> try to write as a fictitious person but it could be a real person mm-hmm. but, uh, uh, you know losing your job yeah Getting a job and everything looks great, and then you lose your job. You lose and the it. Stock market's going to hell, and yeah, you're broke, or <laughs> or you're you're in love with somebody. You think you found your life partner, and right, and then you catch them with somebody else, and and or the last verse, which is about uh, the preacher says, "Be sure I'm going to burn," but the good book says, "I still got time to learn." <laughs> Before they lay me in my grave, there's a chance I might still get saved. Yeah, so profound. It's all up and down from here. <laughs> You know that's life. I, I just I think it's really fun. That song is a rock, and yeah. you know, New Orleans and John Paul wrote yep. uh, a lot of the music on piano, playing that stride. He grew up uh, in he's from Tulsa. I grew up in Memphis. Spent a lot of time in New Orleans mm-hmm. before moving to Nashville. And uh, yeah, and he plays that New Orleans kind of stride piano really great. And uh, yeah, so that's a great song. That's a fun song. Thanks. And quite world on fire, a little reggae there, huh? Yeah. As I said before, I think you know we started that song yeah. on January of uh, of uh, twenty nineteen, I believe mm-hmm. that was. And then when the Australian wildfires were yeah doing you know terrible things to all the kangaroos and wallabies, terrible. and koalas, and you know yeah. not to mention people yeah. and incredible clouds of smoke uh, causing people to 
you know, to have respiratory problems. And so we started writing it. And then later that year, like that was January by April or May of that year, California was on fire as they mm. are again now. There's mm. a fire that I just read today, jumped the containment lines. And uh, another one, oh, really? I didn't hear that. Oh. And, you know, it's, it's record heat in the Southwest right now. And that's and, true. Uh, and record drought as well. And yeah. uh, so uh, World on Fire talks about that. It starts out talking about communication. Mm -hmm. um, the first verse is, uh, let's talk to each other if we still remember how. Uh, and it could be a, a couple talking to each other. In the video of World on Fire, there's a couple sitting on the couch, each of them looking at their cell phones. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, um, and there's an image at the Tower of Babel. And, yeah. Uh, and in the last, the second verse has uh, uh, has stuff about uh, talk about the thousand million creatures' lives destroyed. Yeah. Talk about the air too too thick with smoke and ash to breathe. Talk about destruction is too much to grieve. <clears throat> World on fire, and then it's basically the choruses of prayer. You know, mm -hmm. um, using the word Jah, the Rasta for God. Right. Uh, Right. which was also job goes back to Yahweh, the, yeah. the Hebrew uh, name for God. And, and yeah. uh, so it's, um, you know, I, I like writing songs that hit a lot of bases in that one. Mm -hmm. That one does, but it's, it's the reggae beat. That was uh, uh, Sean Paddock who played drums, uh, has played drums with Kenny Chesney for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, now plays drums on most of this record. And uh, he played on that and John Paul, Play acoustic rhythm and I played electric mm -hmm. rhythm. Uh, John Cowan not only sang back up on that on that song, but played bass on it. Right. And came up with a, a really cool reggae bass part for it. So it's, it was a lot of fun to record. It's a serious subject, but but hopefully people will get a lift oh, yeah. out of it. It's got a good beat. You can dance to it. Exactly. And great lyrics. Thank you, you know, our... Uh, BBS Radio, we started in uh, Paradise and the, you know, Paradise, California, yeah, yeah, wiped out and the station burnt down. Then they moved to Lafayette, California. They wanted to go back to Paradise, but the restrictions there now are so expensive, they have to leave California. So that's why they're moving to Houston. Now they're going to Houston instead of moving out of California. So and hopefully there won't be, won't be too many floods and hurricanes. There. I know, I know. This is the second fire they've been through that their house burnt down too. I, I have a friend who had a house in Malibu and the yeah. Malibu fire wiped that out a couple of years ago. And then they were, she was renting a house in Calabasas mm -hmm. and, and nearly had to evacuate that one. Crazy, isn't it? Uh, because of the fires up in Northern California. You know, my daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter mm -hmm. live in Oakland and you know, they've had to, for the last couple of years, had to wear masks just when they go outside because certain times of year, because the fire seasons have yeah. been so bad, it's apocalyptic. And I hope that enough people get that message yep. that it's not just people in Florida or just people in California, right? Uh, but that everybody is going to be feeling oh, it. Oh, sure. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be life threatening and will change the way of life mm -hmm. for a lot of people. I was, when I was in Congress, I was on the subcommittee or the mm -hmm. select committee mm -hmm. on uh, global warming and energy independence. Mm -hmm. And we heard a lot of testimony, including the very first um, witness that was called in 2007, my first year after I got sworn in to Congress, uh, was Jim Wilsey, James Wilsey, the former head of the CIA for, right. for three presidents of both Republican and Democratic parties. Mm -hmm. and, and Wilsey's comment at that hearing was, what he was asked what the serious the most serious security threat to the United States was. Mm -hmm. And his answer was climate change. Yeah. He said, if we don't, you know, that'll be the most destabilizing thing mm -hmm. for all countries around the world and that it'll, it'll affect our national security. And I've always, you know, when I ran for Congress, I, I wrote most of my own material, my own flyers and mm -hmm. statements and so on to begin with. And I started out saying, Education security is national security. Mm -hmm. Healthcare security is national security. Right. Water, clean water security mm -hmm. is national security. You know, uh, et cetera. Security from being burned out in a wildfire. Mm -hmm. You know, what what else could be affecting your security, your family's right. 
security. It's a bigger threat than what some, mm-hmm. you know, hijacker in another part of the world is is plotting. Yeah, maybe not as dramatic now, but it'll certainly be dramatic. You know, and we heard testimony about uh, of how the grain belt, mm-hmm. where most of the food in this country is grown, if the projections for worst case scenario happen, yeah, that growing latitude is going to move north into Canada. Right. And I asked the head of NOAA, who was giving us a tour uh, of the facility, their facility in Colorado, uh, what, uh, well, in that case, we'll be buying grain from Canada. And he said, yes, but they run into the alluvial plain mm-hmm. where there's rocks and, you know, uh, moraine from glacial activity ages ago. So it doesn't necessarily mean that because growing latitudes are going to go further north, that the other conditions like soil quality and, mm-hmm. and rockiness were, are going to cooperate yeah. with cultivation. So, uh, you know, this is a, it's a situation where uh, coastal cities like Charleston or New York, Philadelphia, uh, mm-hmm. Miami, you know, mm-hmm. Fort Lauderdale, there, there's so many that are already seeing increasing in high tides. Right. Uh, even during non stormy weather, sunny day high tides that cause the water to come up through the manholes yeah. in the street. Um, and uh, it's, it's already documentable, has been documented. Sure. Uh, so, you know, if my writing and singing about it helps people to, uh, I agree, to, to think of it yeah. good. You know, I, I don't have the, the podium of being a member of Congress anymore, but, but it is, I, when I think of my granddaughter, mm-hmm. you know, this is, I just hope that I and my generation sure. can leave her and her mm-hmm. generation exactly. a world they can live on safely. And, yeah. and, and it's in doubt right now. I so have five I grandchildren. People my age need to be yeah. need to really trying to be active about that. Sure. I, I have five grandkids. I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I really worry about that. You know, I worry about, I worry about the water. Uh, the, the oceans, uh, the Gulf, you know, I don't, I'm not into drilling out there in the Gulf. I think that's bad. You know, it yeah. destroys the wild, the, 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 uh, the, the wildlife, all those, when, when they drilled out in the Gulf, all those, the wh- whales, we had uh, the whale sharks, you can see them off the shore of like Tampa, you know, yeah. I mean, they don't be- they don't belong that close to the shore, and it's all because of that mess they made out there. That that spill was horrible. You know, yeah. I I'm surprised Deeper it's road. cleaned up. You know, I, I it can't be cleaned up, right? Well, there are yeah, there's permanent effects of it, mm-hmm. uh, but also there are other wells that leak, and you know, it's gradually, it's but it adds up over time. And um, yeah, I you know, unfortunately, the the, the fact is that. If we want to get a handle on climate change, we should stop drilling for oil. Period. Yeah, I agree. Uh, because the more you drill it and pump it, the more people are going to burn it, uh, petroleum products of any kinds, and that is going to cause the climate to continue to get hotter. So, uh, you know, going back to '79 when we did the No Nukes concerts, right. I mean, at that point we had spent, I think, fifty billion dollars of taxpayer money subsidizing the nuclear industry. It was that doubled at least by now, but also we've subsidized the fossil fuel industry and mm-hmm. have for ages and give them all kinds of tax breaks. And, and, uh, you know, and, and it's, a uh, it's ironic and disturbing to me that, that, um, the companies, the same companies that made gazillions of dollars yeah. polluting this earth may wind up making more gazillions fixing it for us. It may turn out that's the only way to get it fixed, right? Because government may or may not be able to afford to do the job. Mm-hmm. But um, but whatever it is, it comes down to personal choice. I just try to drive the most efficient car I can drive, and mm-hmm. not drive unnecessarily, and yep. uh, and uh, you know buy as little plastic as I can, and I uh, and and recycle and do all the things that I think I can do as an individual, and then and then preach about it like this. <laughs> <laughs> when I have an opportunity, but but my record, I just wanted to remind people, it's not all gloom and doom. And no, no, there are no. other songs that are just you know fun yeah. songs. Oh yeah, it's it's a great album. I I really enjoyed it, and I know everybody will. I I wanted to mention, you know, you you guys worked hard for the no nukes thing, but it 
I, I just read it. Is there 60 commercially operating nuclear plants with 98 nuclear reactors now in the United States? It, that sounds incredible. It was up closer to 100. Really? Day. Yeah, that were operating now. That, oh my, uh, holy cow. Yeah. I didn't realize there were so many. Yeah, and you know, it, and some of them are new, newer than others. Right. Um, there is a conversation going on right now among environmentalists as well as, you know, other planners about whether nuclear power helps with the climate change problem. But huh. the problem, there are a couple problems with it regarding that. One is it's not really carbon free. Right. It takes a lot of diesel power to mine for uranium, mm -hmm. uh, to refine it, to, to truck it, to barge it mm -hmm. uh, to the reactors where um, and when after it gets uh, fissioned in the reactor core, it needs to be cooled forever initially right. in the cooling pond on site. And when there's an outage, then the replacement mm -hmm. power for that and for just the, the power going out into the wires is coming from diesel or natural gas backup generators. And if and when they ever open a this repository for final storage of household, uh, not household hazards, waste, radioactive waste from these reactors, it'll, it'll have to be barged or trucked to that. But more interestingly to me is the fact that nuclear plants in Ohio mm -hmm. and in Florida and a couple of countries in Europe have had to shut down during the summer, last couple of summers, because the bodies of water they were on oh, got too hot to be able to cool the core. They always cite a, a nuclear plant and, and a lot of other power plants on water because they can use the water for cooling. Yeah. And, um, and so if water gets above 70 degrees or so, they're pumping it through the core where the fission reaction is going on, doesn't cool it down. You know? and, and that's what you can run into a problem with the reactor melting down and you have another Fukushima on your on your hands. Mm. So uh, why invest more billions of dollars after the, you know, after what we've already put in, you know, that that kind of generation, the, the nuclear generation kilowatt was supposed to be free right. in the 50s when we started out with the Atoms for Peace program. Right. It uh, was supposed to be too cheap to meter, they say. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's never been free. And now it's the most expensive way to generate power more than natural gas. Yeah. More than solar, more than wind, more than tidal power, more than geothermal, more than hydroelectric. And all those renewables are what we should be spending mm -hmm. any future money on, in my opinion, and efficiency. Right. The cheapest kilowatt is one you don't burn, mm -hmm. you don't use. So if you can make windows more efficient and make insulation mm -hmm. better, especially in old apartment buildings and cities where you mm -hmm. know air conditioning tends to run too much because exactly. there's yeah. so many leaks around the windows and sure. weather stripping and everything. And that's yeah. all. And that's jobs, yep. you know, and that's, it's I not agree. high tech. It's, it's basically uh, carpentry yep. and plumbing. It hires a lot of people. And, uh, you know, we still have really just scratched the surface of things like, yep. like wave power, which has been proven to work mm -hmm. in California, among other places where the, the mm -hmm. buoys, just if you sail at all, or if you're you know boating at all, you see these buoys rising up and down on the waves. Right. And the horns, if you horn a buoy, go, huh, mm -hmm. as you go by it. It's because there's a diaphragm that gets compressed and pushes air through this horn. And mm. that's how they sound. You know, the bell boys rock and make the bell ring. Right. And the ones that have a horn, the waves going up and down make them do that. Well, that's energy mm -hmm. that can be harnessed and has been in California. There have been test, you know, pilot programs with a mm -hmm. field of buoys that where the diaphragm, as the buoy goes right. up and down with the waves, generates electricity and send it on mm -hmm. wires back into the shore and up onto the grid where it goes out and powers homes and businesses. Yeah. And these are things, if we're going to throw money at something, right. You'd be throwing at all those alternatives. How's that for a speech? <laughs> I wish you were still there, you know? Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, I think. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's all knowledge. It's, it's just, you know, things that we all should try to acquaint mm -hmm. ourselves with. And, and, uh, you know, how we vote should be at least in large part determined by that. You know, I'm not going to vote for somebody who I think is going to make this planet right unlivable for my granddaughter who lives in Oakland, California. Right. Or really anywhere on, you know, in this country or on the earth. <clears throat> so, um, or I'm also not going to support a corporation. Mm -hmm. 
does things that I think are environmentally. Well, that's that's more important virus. than the politician, you know, the, the corporation. In some ways they have more power, but that's exactly you know, the, the high tech companies, uh, yeah. you know, have have more capital than most of the countries on the face of the earth. So many people but, think about the president. Oh, it's his fault. He should do this. It's your local um, you know, people that you should be more concerned about, you know, this in your own state, you know? Well, you can have more an effect on your local people. Yeah, exactly. Your, your local officials, your county officials, your state officials. Right. You can have more of an effect on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they respond. I mean, I served in, you know, Congress sure. for two terms and I had right. a staff that had somebody who was always in charge of veterans affairs. I had somebody who was mm -hmm. always in charge of, of passports and visas getting you know problems solved for the people in the right. I represented my constituents and um, you know if, if I were to call up or if anybody the you know the average person calls up your congressman's office or women's uh, office mm -hmm. and says you know uh, I've got a problem because the the septic system and or the sewer system in my town is not right uh, is not working right or because uh, you know, I have such and such, you know, I can't stand the emissions from this mm -hmm. refinery mm -hmm. upwind for me right. uh, that are blowing by and my family's having to breathe. Whatever it is, it's like, then they respond. Mm -hmm. They keep a pro and con on every issue of how many sure. people call, how many people write mm -hmm. uh, to them and email or text them. And and uh, so I, I would say, you know, if you're not a squeaky wheel, you know, right. nobody will respond. So, so that's, I learned that being on the, on the congressional side of things yep. or the county legislative side of things, yeah. people would call me and ask me to fix their, you know, to help get their sewer system fixed, mm -hmm. their, their mm -hmm. septic system mm -hmm. or approve, get it approved. Yeah. And, um, you know, we don't do county elected officials at any level don't necessarily do all of that, but they do mm -hmm. a lot. Of and, uh, so yeah, talking to your local people is 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 very, really important very very important. was ralph nader i think said all pot politics begins at home at home right that's and, true yeah. yeah you should worry about your the place you live you know first your, your state so back back to the happy funny <laughs> songs <laughs> you, you knew we were going to go the, the, yeah you know, with, with, you know with these kind of issues you know. <laughs> can't uh, help it the song that comes after World on Fire and before mm -hmm. Welcome Home is uh, yeah. a Future Ex-Wife, which is- yeah, another... yeah, I, I love that title. <laughs> and, um, I've heard the people use that phrase. and uh, mm -hmm. But the idea that they were kind of shaped by our families and so that we tend to repeat patterns, right. maybe we're trying to recreate our parents' relationship or mm -hmm. something that we grew up with. And uh, the bridge to that song says, like a moth to a lantern, it feels like mm -hmm. a pattern I'm doomed to repeat. You know, it's a... That's a great lyric. Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, thank you. It's it's just, but it's a real fun song. Mm -hmm. uh, I played I played the guitars on, John Paul played, Paul played mm -hmm. the bass on it, and and Sean Paddock, the drummer, the Kenny Chesney uh, drummer who played on mm -hmm. most of the stuff, played drums on it, and it's, yeah. it's just, it's funny. It's about as... <laughs> a serious thing but it's good to be able to laugh about it i also want to mention uh the uh, I lost my train of thought here uh the, the big album the um no more than you can handle right um you did something during isolation in 2020 i think right about that you know regarding that album which which is it's a double disc. I made a video of the song, the title yeah. song. No more than you can handle. That's got everything Orleans on that on that yeah. album. Right? It's 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 incredible. Yeah, the re that record, uh, no more than you can handle, has the Orleans has like dance with me and still the one and right. uh, and you know a lot of album tracks, but also has live versions of a lot of songs. It's a it's a double CD with you know one of them being live and one of them being studio, mm -hmm. and uh, but we did a ver uh, a video in 2020. Right, it was there was the first thing that we did uh, collaboratively, um, from isolation, each of us in our own homes, and and you can find that if you go to OrleansOnline.com, 
right uh, or to YouTube that we have a channel mm -hmm. so it's online on YouTube so uh, you can see that video and you can see the home video which is another one that we did later that year um, a song that I had released previously on a solo record but had never done it with Orleans before and we did a, a pretty nice version of that in my opinion and and uh, and a video of us uh, doing it Cindy Cashtower who's a a wonderful uh, uh, lap steel player and Dover mm -hmm. player played played lap steel on it. She's a former Americana Musician of the Year uh, oh. awardee from the uh, Americana <clears throat> Music Association, and and uh, she's uh, played with everybody from Sleep at the Wheel to uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, the, a list of people that uh, I'm not going to be able to. Uh, apparently remember right now but um but anyway so uh that started a series of things that uh you know we started recording new songs in isolation right. we're working on a christmas album the first one we've ever done it'll awesome be it's just about finished needs a couple more instruments on mm -hmm. a couple of songs and then it'll be mixed it'll be done by the <laughs> end of june and uh and we're also working on a 50th anniversary record because the first show we did as Orleans was in January of 1972. So this coming January, oh yeah, hard to believe, but it'll be our 50th uh, anniversary. So that record is going to come out, you know, the beginning of the year. It's amazing, isn't it? 50 years. It is, wow. but you know, there are a lot of brand new songs that have been written yeah. uh, recently, and and mm -hmm. some that we've had but never cut them mm -hmm. uh, or are recutting them, and a few that we we picked from, you know, songs other people had written, but it's all new material for Orleans and we're, we're excited about both of those projects. I, I want to mention Orleans is going to be back in Clearwater on Friday, July 23rd at Ruth Eckerd Hall. And you guys are going to be with the Pure Prairie League and my buddies, Firefall. I've had every member from Firefall on the show. Oh, these guys are awesome. And these are three very tight bands. You guys, you guys are so tight. Orleans has always been a tight band. Pure Prairie League. I mean, I, I, I love this, you know, this uh, lineup. It's, it's, it's incredible. We play with those guys a lot. And yeah. uh, we get repackaged with them. We, before Rusty Young passed away, mm -hmm. rest, rest his soul. Uh, we, we played with Poco a lot. Uh, yep. Played with Ambrosio a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we just did a show with... Uh, <clears throat> Land rhythm section in Georgia, yeah, Hiawassee, Georgia. You know, but it, it's it's the era I think that we came out of uh, that we're best known for. The songs we're best known for came out of the late seventies, and and so that's uh, that's what people are uh, are packaging us together with, right? And they're all great guys and great players and singers, and we yeah. get to, to hear and see some of the folks <laughs> that we love do their material. Now, are you part of this yacht rock? new phase music they're calling well, yacht rock yeah they play, they play our music <laughs> yeah but, um, but um you know and i've i've spoken to those folks we did it was called sail rock mm -hmm. in uh, 2013 it was the right. year after larry died i had just gotten back in the band yeah uh, and um we went out with christopher cross and robbie dupree and, right and gary wright and the player and mm -hmm. A bunch of bands that were, you know, are kind of in that mm -hmm. rocky world. Yeah, and uh, we were actually the house band backing up John John Ford Coley doing the yep. England Dan and John Ford Coley songs. Mm -hmm. uh, Love is the answer. Yeah, he's so, been on the show. <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, good guy. Great writer, great musician. Yeah, uh, so we we had a lot of fun doing that, and and uh, but. Then they changed the yacht next year from sail rock mm -hmm. to yacht rock. The yacht rock, yeah. yeah. And I had a sailboat, but not a, a, a yacht, really. So yeah, that's why I wasn't allowed on there. <laughs> so some of the other guys that were in politics, I I didn't know. I knew about Sonny Bono, you know, but I didn't right. know about Martha Reeves that she was involved in in politics as well. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Between 2005 and 2009, she served on the Detroit City Council. Good for her. That's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm really happy to hear that. Yep. Uh, yeah. There have yeah. been a couple of couple of people who 
were sort of amateur songwriters or mm -hmm. performers. Um, and I can't remember their names now, but but uh, I guess Martha and me and uh, and Sonny. Um, yeah. I didn't know Sonny, but mm -hmm. um, God bless him. Yeah, I served with his wife, Mary, his widow, Mary Bono, mm -hmm. in Congress. Uh, after he died, she ran for and won the seat that he had right. served in. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to see Larry, uh, Larry Hoppin here in, Sar in Sarasota. He did uh -huh. a Giving Hunger the Blues show. And him and John Cafferty, it was in 2011. I got mm -hmm. some great pictures of Larry, by the way, if you, if you ever right. need pictures of Larry. We always need pictures, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he was fantastic. Uh, and uh, I, I, like you, I, I do miss him. He was, he was a, you know, great voice. You know, yeah. he seemed like a great I, guy. The interesting yeah. thing about uh, about Larry and me and mm -hmm. the double lead guitar, so we could like, I'm still the one that's that double lead solo. Right. Love and, uh, and same thing on What I Need or, mm -hmm. or, or uh, Waking and Dreaming. Um, when I first met Larry, I had been playing in New York doing sessions and a few club gigs and and um, writing and directing music for a Broadway show and an off-Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And but I was assigned to Columbia by Harvey Brooks, the bass player from the Electric Flag, who had played on Bob oh, Dylan's yeah. Blonde on Blonde record. And sure. He, thought he was a kind of legendary bass player. But um, he played with and hung out with Paul Butterfield and so you know mm -hmm. around the other Albert Grossman, Woodstock, New York crowd. Um, but so I went to a jam session at, at Harvey's loft and um, in Soho, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I walked in with my guitar, plugged in with an amplifier and everybody's playing, a bunch of musicians playing already. Wells Kelly was the original drummer from Orleans. Uh, had not, I had worked with him in the studio, but had not performed with him yet, mm -hmm. was playing drums and uh, Harvey was playing bass. And, and Paul Harris, who uh, legendary keyboard player from Manassas, Steve Stills, mm -hmm. and, and from uh, he had a gold record on his on his bathroom door mm -hmm. from the inside of the bathroom door from doing the horn arrangement for the Doors Soft Parade album. Oh, cool! And uh, you know, but these guys were all jamming. Yeah. And I picked up my guitar, plugged it into an amplifier, and started playing. It was just funky jam in the key of D, and I started playing. The melody to uh, the theme from Aquarius. Well, really? no, 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 it is in the seven. No. <laughs> yep. I just playing instrumentally. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And across the loft, I hear somebody playing harmony with me. A third above, you know, guitar, lead guitar, a third above my mm -hmm. melody I was playing. And it was Larry Hoppin. Mm -hmm. And I just, I uh, when we finished, we did some kind of blues ending on the song. And, hmm. I got up and walked across the room and shook, took, sucked my hand out and shook his hand. I said, I'm John Hall. And he said, I'm Larry Hoppin. And that was how we met. Hmm. It was just like magic guitar connection. And then it turned out he's also a fabulous singer and, and mm -hmm. uh, was the lead vocalist on Still the One. I'm still the One, yeah. And, and uh, we wound up making a lot of really good music together. And, yeah. And he was also a very generous guy with his time and efforts for humanitarian yeah, stuff, yeah. including... Uh, trying to raise money for kids with AIDS to get the yeah. property. And, uh, and so, you know, it's a, it's a family vocal blend with, with Larry, mm -hmm. Lance, our bass player, mm -hmm. still our bass player, mm -hmm. and singing a lot of leads now. He didn't sing so many lead parts back then, but yeah. uh, he's singing a lot of Larry's parts now. And their younger brother, Lane, mm -hmm. who plays mm -hmm. keyboard and trumpet and melodica, as did Larry. And they all have that Hoppin family sound and blend mm -hmm. well together. So, so, and I've been singing with Hoppins long enough that I can blend with anyone. <laughs> I heard you sing still the one on, on YouTube. You do a good, you do a great job. <laughs> who, who's singing as high as, as Larry did. Yeah. 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 Who, who's singing it in concert? Who sings? Still uh, the Fly song? Amaro, the, the other guitar player from the band. Okay. Right. He replaced me when I was out of the band. Right. One is when I was doing solo projects, right. and once when I was in Congress, Fly was was my replacement in the band, and he mm -hmm. and Larry played together. So he knows all Larry's parts and all of my parts. And yeah, after Larry passed away, I, and I came back to the band. Now Fly and I since then are playing and singing together, and, mm -hmm. and he has a great voice, and he's an unbelievable guitar player. So 
Um, so that's a lot of fun and it's closing another circle for me. Well, you got a great tour coming up and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope to see you in Clearwater for sure. J John, here's your final question. And I, I probably asked you this before when, when I interviewed last time. Uh, if you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? <laughs> well, if, if you count the deceased ones. Yeah, um, sure. I'd say Red, Red Charles or Aretha Franklin. Right? Oh, wow. But, but you know, I, I would love to, uh, I'd love to do some work with Larry, Car Larry Carlton. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to, you know, to play or write with or for uh, Robin Ford or um, I, I, I would love to work with Lake Street Dive in any capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've, I've been on stage or shared a stage with uh, Rosie Sills and Nash, uh, not never with Neil Young, but I'd love to do work with Neil Young. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Snarky Puppy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you know, the, I'm a very lucky guy because I've worked with already so many people whose work I admire. And you have. I'm excited about, you know, playing and singing and writing with. And uh, so I'm, I'll just take the opportunities or the, the intersections, the serendipity brings them to me as, as uh, the great spirit brings, you know, me into their lives or them into my life. It, you know. Yeah, of course, you worked so with Janice people. Joplin. Which Janice, is, yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's pretty big. Yeah. Did you meet Jimi Hendrix? Have you met Jimmy? Uh, Jimmy came to hear my band Kangaroo, uh -huh. uh, our band Kangaroo at the Cafe Wild in Greenwich Village. Right. I uh, sat in the front row. I was playing bass in that band and Teddy Spilios was playing guitar and he, Teddy had, had his guitar in Jimmy's face and his foot on his table. As he was oh, I think as I recall, we were all tripping at the time. <laughs> uh, and maybe he was too. <laughs> But um, I never met him. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, I've I've uh, that was an incredible time. I mean, I, I during that time when we were playing at the Cafe Wild in Greenwich Village, uh, Jimmy was playing as Jimmy James in the Blue Flames mm -hmm. around the corner at the Cafe Gogo, -Go backing up right. uh, John Hammond mm -hmm. doing straight blues. Yeah, and. Uh, James Taylor, the Flying Machine, his band at the time with Danny Korchmar on guitar mm -hmm. and uh, El uh, Bishop O'Brien playing drums and and uh, and uh, Zach Wiesner playing bass. We're playing at the uh, Night Owl Cafe mm -hmm. on Fourth Street in Greenwich Village, and the Love and Spoonful had just left the Night Owl Cafe to go on the road oh, after yeah. they had a hit with "Do You Believe in Magic." Mm -hmm. It was just it's such a fertile time uh, in the village at that point. And I've, been, I've had a couple of those things. I've been in Nashville when it was really right. happening here. I've been in Woodstock a lot when it was really happening there. And, uh, you know, I'd still love to, uh, to work with some of those people who I know from those times again, or work with them in a different way. Um, right. But um, I've never actually played I was on stage with Bruce Springs one time at, at Madison Square Garden at uh, Pete Seeger's 90th birthday celebration. Mm -hmm. And um, along with Del McCoury and mm -hmm. I think Jackson was there and, and yeah, you know, a, a ton of other artists who were all honoring Pete. And, uh, but I would love to work with Bruce in some way. I shared a stage alternating sets with him at the Cafe Wow. Uh, ages ago for both of us but you know it's a i'm just waiting to be surprised by you know whatever happens next so yeah i want to stick around to see what what it is you were born in baltimore and so oh, was wow. i so oh, was really? i yeah yeah and well, you you performed in the georgetown in dc i i worked in dc for years and years and years Mm -hmm. uh, my dad had stores in DC and I, I had a lot of politician customers. Uh, right. I had drinks with James Wright, the speaker of the house at the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. We had drinks together at a club. Um, I, I, uh, Senator Warner bought some things for me. Um, 
what, what's his name? The, uh, the, the right hand man from Ronald Reagan that died from a uh, brain tumor. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Um, the one who recanted at the end of his life. He was also a, uh, a guitar player. He was an excellent guitar player. Uh, he was a client of mine. He always bought headphones, the best headphones. Uh, I, I can't think of his name now, and it's terrible. But yeah, it was very interesting working in DC all these years. I saw a lot of things. Uh, yeah, especially no, in the sixties. It's been it's been pretty interesting. I you know I had a couple of highlights from from that. Mm -hmm. It connected the music and the politics. You know, Jackson Brown told me, right, keep a guitar in your office. Yeah. It might be what keeps you sane, you know, and I, I had, I did do that. I kept an acoustic yeah. guitar there and, and, uh, and I was uh, on my way up in the elevator to a series of votes mm -hmm. and, and one of my Republican colleagues turned to me in the elevator and said, mm -hmm. did you really write that song dance with me? And I said, yes. And he said, <laughs> could you sign this for my wife? That was the first, <laughs> first dance we had at our wedding. And, you know, it's just you never know. Music crosses all boundaries. It, it and, does. And, yeah. It, it, so it's uh, it's good to have a language everybody speaks. Exactly. I want to thank you, John, for being on the show today, man. It's been a great thank pleasure. For me. It's it's great to see you again. Uh, good luck with the tennis. I mean, you're going to miss racquetball. You can't just quit racquetball. I love. No, racquetball. I probably do. I have to have some work done on my knees before I can do it. I, I know. Either. Me too. Yeah. It's, but uh, I I played enough. I played enough sports that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I was a big skier and ski instructor, and I was really? a wind surfer, uh, you know, which is all of your joints and your whole body works when you're windsurfing. <clears throat> and uh, so over the years, I just gradually wore the cartilage <clears throat> down, and, and but hopefully uh, either the stem cell platelet treatment will work mm -hmm. and I'll grow it back, or, or they'll do whatever the newfangled next <clears throat> thing is to it. So, I've, I've got metal plates up and down my right arm. From several surgeries from falling down and doing stupid things. Well, stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. I'm half bionic now, I guess, you know. Yeah, um, you know, I think you know, it's, it's as a friend of mine says, nice to be here, nice to be anywhere. Yeah, and you're, you're absolutely so, right. But, but we're, you know, my, I, I've always loved music. I started playing because I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I didn't set out to be successful in the business right I, and i didn't uh set out to be famous mm -hmm. um I, I was playing guitar you know when i was 12 at high school dances three guys playing and singing through one amplifier uh, an old sears and roebuck silver tone amplifier <laughs> at the time it was all distortion probably but yeah. um but i was doing it because i loved it and i still mm -hmm. love it so that's uh, that's what i do retirement is a foreign term to me at the moment mm -hmm. so anyway yeah i don't blame you don't retire don't retire okay. Wait, you know how much tennis can you play right yeah i haven't started playing golf yet that's something yeah. i'm gonna that's wait next. till i'm older yeah. but uh i remember bill bradley the uh basketball yep. player from oh, yeah. new york next new york. was a senator from new york yep. from new jersey sorry new jersey senator bill bradley was asked i think after he got out of congress mm -hmm. with he was going to take up golf now and he said i would never play a, a sport where the ball was that small <laughs> so that's I, funny. I kind of feel the same way but i'll i'll probably change my mind yeah at some point yeah. well, a, lot need, of, a, lot of, a lot of rock and rollers who play golf you know you yeah. can go out and play with alice cooper <laughs> he's a great golfer uh -huh. <laughs> well, i, I want to mention alice but maybe i will someday yeah um, purchased a brand new album by John Hall entitled Reclaiming My Time at Amazon.com. You can get it today. Don't forget Orleans will be performing Friday, July 23rd at Ruth Eckerd Hall with Pure Perry League and Firefall. Uh, I will be attending that. For more information about John Hall and Orleans, visit johnhallmusic.com. He's on Instagram backslash John Hall Music, Facebook www.facebook.com backslash John Hall dot musician uh, Orleans www.orleans.com Orleans, Orleans is on, on Facebook Orleans, Orleans online dot com Orleans online dot com and you can also check out all the uh, latest music on YouTube as well 
Uh, very special thanks to the great Ann Layton, who I've known now for many years of Layton Media. She's awesome. Uh, Layton Media Music Services motivation for today's interview with John Hall. And of course, the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio, who are in the process of moving to Houston as we speak. John, peace, love, stay healthy, man. Do, yes, do everything you. that you do. You're doing, you know, getting the word out through your music now, and we really appreciate that. Thanks, Ray. And uh, thank you so much for having me on, and, and uh, look forward to uh, the next time. Okay, John. Um, we'll, we'll probably see you around Christmas time. Excellent. Okay. All Have right. Bye-bye now. Take care. Uh, thanks. Bye.